This is Ryan Elliott for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. We're in Liverpool. It's the day before fight night. Callum Smith defending the WBA world title against John Ryder. With me, Shane McGuigan. Shane, always nice to see you. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, always good. It's uh, nice, to, nice to do an interview with you, you for a change. Obviously not getting hassled by Tebbit and Headbutt, you know what I mean? So, um, so that's good. And yeah, here, for, here in Liverpool for... Obviously, Craig Glover versus uh, Chris Burns Smith, and for the Commonwealth title, so it should be a good fight. I'm glad you addressed the elephant in the room before I. That is, in fact, not Rob Tebbett behind this camera. You two have some sort of a cult following on Boxing Social, you two in interviews together. I'm sure Rob's watching this. I'm sure he's incredibly jealous. He's not sat behind this camera. But enough of him. Let's get down to business. As you mentioned, here for Chris Burns Smith, uh, challenging for the Commonwealth title against Craig Glover tomorrow evening. Big opportunity for Chris. How important was it in your mind, I know it is in his, that he went straight back into a, another competitive domestic fight on the back of the React Ball fight? Yeah, I mean, we were, going to take, we, were, we were you know, originally going to take like a little six-rounder at York Court, and then Eddie gave me the phone call and said, look, what do you reckon about fighting? Because um, I said, look, you know, if there's another opportunity that pops up, I, I felt like he, he beat Richard React Ball, close fight, watched it back, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a very close fight. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's just sort of one of those things that you know, what you're what you're looking for and what catches your eye. And if you put the sky commentary on mute, then it it was quite an even even fight. But um, but you know, I was going to get him a little tick over anyway, just to sort of try and get him something in a, in a new year. But this opportunity came up, and yeah, I mean, Lawrence Coley, another one of uh, my fighters, Chris's stable mate. He was uh, he relinquished the belts, and uh, you know. The, the British and the Commonwealth, and this opportunity, this opportunity arises, and that's it. You know, we, we we took it with both hands. Obviously, we know that coming off a loss like that, you can't, you're not going to get gifted opportunities. But and this isn't anything but a gift because it's a very very hard fight against Craig Glover. But it's a fight that I believe is is a is a is a very winnable fight for Chris. They've done six round sparring. It was a fantastic spar, and you know, evenly evenly matched spar. Um, and then, you know, it's just one of those ones that I believe that Chris has come on quite a lot since that spa. Um, and, um, yeah, I just feel like his attributes are going to be, are going are to be, you know, the speed, um, his in-close fighting, the fact that he's got a little bit of height on him as well. Um, I think they're going to be big, big factors in this fight, but Craig Glover's a good puncher. Um, it's good. It's just a great fight, and it's an opportunity that's that's come up. But it's one that Chris has to take it. You know, he's only had one loss, and it was a you know it was a split decision loss. But at the same time, it's you know he's not an Olympian. He's not he's not got the following that that uh, most of these guys coming through have. So he has to uh, he has to take the opportunities when they arise. Style-wise, um, in comparison to the React Poor fight, where there was a lot of sort of wrestling on the inside, a lot of holding. Do you think? Even though Chris obviously got his plaudits on the back of that close defeat, this is almost a, a better fight stylistically for him to showcase himself that it'll be, it'll be a lot less messy and sort of bitty and they'll probably both get to work a couple of rounds in. Yeah, I mean, Glover's a, he's a good clean fighter. Um, he, he's, he's a good technician. Um, and that, I just think it's, it's going to blend well with Chris's style. You know, React Paul was smothering the work a lot. You know, he was throwing big shots and then leaning on him and, and, and the size was hard for for Chris to get his clean work off on the inside. Um, yeah, I think Chris has learned a lot from that fight against Riyad Paul, even though you know it was a, it's a completely different fight come than, than what we're going into to, tomorrow night. But it's just it's doing it on the big stage in front of the big lights and not behind closed do uh, doors sparring with bigger gloves on. It's having that confidence, belief, also knowing how to pace yourself through 10 rounds. And once you've done 10, you know, 12 is... is, is it isn't going to be a problem, you know what I mean? And I think um, yeah, the two of them are, are quite relatively inexperienced when it comes to the, the fighting championship rounds, uh, Chris and Craig. But, um, you know, Chris is in a, in a gym that, that he's got a lot of championship fighters. He's, he's seen the preparations of George, Frampton, um, you know, Taylor, Campbell, all these guys coming through preparing for 12-round fights. And... You know, this is his first one that he's had to prepare for, and um, I just believe he's in the best shape of his life. You know, he's he's learnt a lot from the React Board defeat, and um, and yeah, I mean, you know, we checked his weight last night, and he, just looking at him physically, he was he was in phenomenal shape, and 
Yeah, he sparred, he sparred a, a lot of rounds with uh, Jordan Thomas, Don Charles's guys. He's, he's done he's done a lot of rounds with um, loads, loads of guys up in London. We've travelled. Um, I, I've got out of my comfort zone. <laughs> Normally, I get all the sparring fighters to come to me, but um, but now I've got up and you know I've got, gone with Chris and we've travelled around to get the get the the best sparring possible because he's going to need it. This is a this is a very live fight. Now you mentioned there, obviously Chris has improved immensely under yourself. Uh, he turned over with you. He's he sort of improved along the way. Um, but as you said, he wasn't an Olympian that came to you with a gold medal, anything like that. He's surrounded by these champions. I know I spoke to him about the importance of claiming the Commonwealth title, still considered a very prestigious title. Yeah. What do you think it would mean to him? And, and would it give you a big sense of pride as well to see him be able to take that belt back to the South Coast? Oh, definitely. And I think, you know, he sells a lot of tickets, um, Chris does. I mean, I think he's going to have a better, better support. Obviously, a lot of Smith's fans and, you know, and um, Dodd's fans and people like that, Farrell's fans are going to be supporting Glover, but I don't think he's that big of a draw. I think Chris, you know, uh, the opportunity for Matchroom would be a, would be a lot bigger if, the, if, um, if Chris won. And when he wins, I believe he'll, have a, he'll, have, he'll be able to take a, take a show back down to Bournemouth and... He does great numbers down there, and he did he did a hell of a lot for the React Ball fight. And I think you know, um, yeah, it was, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be great. I, I really didn't feel didn't feel robbed with the React Ball f fight, and I, I just felt like it was he put up a good account of himself. But he could have got he could have boxed better, and really it would have been nicer to have had a had a decent test before going into that. Um, but he, you know, he, he he rose to the occasion. I feel like he's learnt so much from it, and his confidence is just shot up after it, rather than getting out down and annoyed about it. So you know, um, you know, to, for him to get his hands on a on a on a title will be will be brilliant. For those that don't know how you and Chris sort of came to be as a duo, so to speak, I mean, you've been there with him since his pro debut. I remember being down there that night in Bournemouth against Ross Henshaw yeah. to where he is now challenging for the Commonwealth title. If you could just explain to people how that came to be. I understand you brought him in for a bit of sparring and, yeah. and he just sort of stuck around, so to speak. Yeah, no, he was, he was always a really, really good spar for, uh, for George. And I think he came up on New, Year, Chris, uh, sorry, uh, New Year's Eve. And on New Year's Eve, on New Year's Day, and I'm like, I don't, no one was keen enough to come and spar. And it was the first fight that I had with George. Uh, it was on the end of January in 2015. And I basically was like, look, at the guy, my assistant at the time, who's now Derek Chisora's coach, Steve Broughton, he was like, look, I've got this guy that I've seen on the amateur circuit. He's keen as anything. I'll get him to come down. I says, oh, brilliant. And then just kept bringing him back, kept bringing him back for sparring. And... And then uh, he went in the ABAs a couple of times, I think, or maybe one, one or two seasons, and and was like, didn't you know, got far, but you know, he didn't really have the sparring, the, co the coaching system behind him, and and asked me and kept asking me, asked me, said, you know, can I can I come down for a trial? And uh, yeah, and I, I basically I had a lot of fighters at the time, and um, and it just felt like I, I want to give this guy an opportunity, and and and. Uh, Gave him an opportunity, and I realised he was 20% of his capability. You know, he was do he he was teaching in himself, and he wasn't getting the proper sparring. And I think the way to develop fighters is great sparring, and also lots of pad work, lots of drills, and then there's a massive mental aspect to be around championship fighters and start to believe in yourself, believe in your power, um, and hold yourself in, in in a championship mindset. And and I've just seen him grow. You know, massively since he's come in, and and obviously, you know, we've had a setback in the last one, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't the best of camps. You know, I mean, it was uh, for for that fight. There was there was a I was dealing with a lot personally, and and um, yeah, we had we just it was it was just a tough one to get through, and uh, obviously, yeah, you know, he he got he got he got pipped by a point that was a knockdown that that really did it. So um, we like that we like that rematch. And I'd also just, but just for me, just to see the development in him um, as a man, you know what I mean, as a fighter, it was brilliant. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited for him to, to continue to fulfil his potential. Just moving away from Chris, um, elsewhere on the bill, top in the bill, Callum Smith, first fight back in Liverpool for two years, first fight back in Liverpool since he claimed the WBA world title. 
Um, you've been in the opposite corner against Callum Smith. You'll know plenty of him. Big ask for John Ryder Saturday night. He's in a good run of form himself, but how do you see the fight playing out? And obviously, apart from being an absolute freak at 168, what is it that makes Callum Smith so special? I mean, it is, it's his timing, um, his size. It, it, it felt like we were boxing a cruiserweight, literally looking across at him out in, out in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I was like, I mean, he... I know he does the weight well. He's just one of these guys that, I mean, Taylor's quite similar. He's massive for the weight and does it well. And everyone's thinking, oh, they must struggle. But, but um, just that lucky, <laughs> lucky fucking gene, isn't it? The guys that don't put much weight on and that are quite naturally skinny, but they also hold their strength. So, um, you know, that, that's it. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a very, very well-rounded fighter. He can box in, in close. He can punch throughout all of the leverage of the shot. Do you know what I mean? Um, he can knock guys out close. He can knock guys out at distance. And, um, you know, George came away from that fight. And, you know, George will never admit it, but let's be honest, he wasn't 100%. That we rushed that. Well, his shoulder's still not 100% since that. And, uh, you know, it just, we, we knew we were in, a, in the deep end and against uh, Callum Smith because he, he was a very, very quality operator. But, you know, he's he's proved himself against uh, Ndam in his last fight looked sensational in that one but you know I just I just look at John Ryder and I look at the development he's had recently he started working with a guy called Dan Lawrence as a strength coach um, who used to work with George Groves he's obviously worked with Tony Sims for, for throughout his professional career um, they've had a setback with Billy Joe they had a setback with Nick Blackwell moved up in weight um, and yeah I just think he, he lost to Rocky Fielding as well, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. But then he's he's moved up in weight um, and just developed this this power. And personally, I, I box in the novices with uh, in the national novices with John Ryder, and we were seeing each other in every single stage. And we got a photo after. I like, will actually try and try and get him to dig that photo out because his I think it was his dad took a took a photo of us afterwards. And just he's such a such a nice guy. Keeps himself to himself. Um, always you know always polite always respectful and i'm i'm really happy for him i'm happy that he's that he's done this much in his career and um he was always a good fighter he was always a really good good sort of pro style but um and i you know they're both great guys they're both good ambassadors for the sport um but on the grand scheme of things i believe Callum's going to win um and i believe it opens up a lot of doors to fight uh, past it Golovkin, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, great fight for him. Um, you know, potentially Eubank Jr. as well. Um, and then obviously the, the Golden Goose is Canelo. So there's just some huge opportunities out there. And I, I think it would be better for British boxing if, um, if Callum won. And I believe he, he will win. And I, I don't want to put out my prediction because I, I, I generally don't know. It, it could go early, but I think it, I think it could be... Um, a quite a late, a quite a late sort of fight, potentially a points fight for uh, for Cam Smith. Elsewhere on Sky Sports on the same evening, uh, Deontay Wilder in his rematch with Luis Ortiz. Feels like yesterday we were sat in a very snowy Glasgow following Josh Taylor's win over Winston Campos, watching the first fight. Um, they're running it back when it was first announced. I think a lot of people were were just sort of not too pleased in the aspect it was such a conclusive knockout in the first fight. Obviously, great entertainment while it lasted. We saw Wilder hurt. Ortiz getting on a bit, perhaps. Do you think it'll just be a case of repeating, perhaps a bit sooner this time? I think so. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be a wilder finish, um, and a bit, yeah, a bit quicker. Was it seven rounds? Is it? Or I think it was a bit later than that. Maybe was it? Oh, was it? Okay, yeah. Um, but no, it was a great fight, and and what a fantastic fight. I mean, Ortiz has failed a couple of drug tests. I think since then, what's the what's the testing system going on? Um, He's 40, year, 40 years old. Is he older than that? Uh, you know, he's been around a hell of a long time. He's been about 40 for the last five years, I think it is. Um, but yeah, I just I think Wilder's got he's got a way of once he's figured somebody out, he figures them out. And and uh, and I just think you've seen it with Stavern. Yes, yeah, Stavern was was inactive and stuff, but just just devastation in the second fight and I, I think um, this one I think I, you know, I don't see it going much more than four rounds and 
he's always live. He's a fantastic te technician, Lewis Ortiz, but um, it could be a factor of athleticism and youth. And even though he's uh, Ortiz is linked up linked up with coach Larry Wade, who's a really good S and C coach, knows his stuff, works with me with the team, but there's only so much you can do with an athlete when their speed and athleticism is gone. Um, and sometimes tinkering with things too late in, in a boxer's uh, career is a bad thing. And sometimes they can fall flat on their face. You know what I mean? Um, he looks quite lean, looks quite light. Uh, and that, you know, that, and that, that, that could be, that could take away from his punch resistance. So, Either way, I mean, Wilder hurt him throughout that fight. He had the, he had the ability to, to to hurt Wilder. I think he still got the ability, but I just think from from a from a youth technical standpoint, I think uh, Wilder's going to probably knock him out in three four rounds. Moving away from this card, uh, just go on to your stable, Josh Taylor, yeah. the new unified super lightweight world champion. I don't think you and I have spoken on camera since then. You've spoken to Rob about 20 times. But in terms of us, uh, Josh has been away enjoying the fruits of his labour. Yeah. Um, well deserved. Mm -hmm. Going into next year, though, um, you know, this talk of will he sign with such and such? Will he go and fight such and such? We know Ramirez and Postel are fighting out in China. Yeah. Um, so that sort of rules out the, the undisputed fight for now. Have you had a think and have you maybe spoken to Josh at all about what could be next going into 2020? Yeah, I mean, at the moment we're just sitting and, I mean, he's got a mandatory with the IBF. We have to have to think about, um, we've got to start making some moves reasonably soon from a promotional standpoint and a managerial standpoint. But from a career point of view, he needs to take time to relax, rest. He's had, I think it was 94-1 and one his last uh Four, three opponents or whatever it was, or four opponents. It's, he's 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 had a hard old <laughs> he's had a hard year. You know what I mean? And he's he's young. He's youthful enough to be able to to withstand that sort of consistent training camps. But you know the the body needs a chance to rest, and and so does the mind. And so you know what I mean? And the, him and Danielle have had a had a pretty tough time during that training camp as well, with her fa her father passing. So the plan for the foreseeable couple of weeks is to sit back, relax and, and, in, and enjoy himself and and enjoy what what all that hard work since he was 15, 16 years of age has is, 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 um, concluded to. You know what I mean? He's he's a, he's a unified world champion, Ring Magazine champion and still the same bloke he was when he walked through the, the doors with myself in, after the Commonwealth Games and I see he's got Terry and... In the in, in the corner as well, who's his who was his amateur coach, and he's just you know what I mean he's just the same old Josh. So, you know, I personally would like him to to not have a. And we I thought about it. We we we've been thinking about having a tick over fight, but but really at this stage of his career, it, it's big fights, and um, you know I, I'd love that Ramirez fight. And yeah, it's not going to be around the corner, but um, we, we can see what we can do. You know, we we got. A lot of people interested in Josh Taylor. He's, um, you know, from promotionally and manage, managerially, we look after him. But you know, we've got Eddie Hearn, we've got Al Heyman, we've got um, people from top rank. We've got loads of people in, in the states, you know, that are, that are interested in him. And um, and it's just about making sure, doing the right things for Josh, you know, and, and he's happy. Um, and you know, he could. He could fight ten times more, fifteen times more, and five of them be a, against elite fighters, and ten of them be against the okay guys, and just you know going through the motions. Or he can fight seven or eight more times and make every single fight worth worth its while. And it, and sometimes if that means you have to wait a little bit, you have to wait a little bit. And and um, yeah, he's had sixteen fights, and every single one of them has has been. Um, a fast track situation to, to make sure he's he went straight into six rounders and eights and up to championship uh, championship fights and um, and it's just always been quick 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 go go with him and I think we've got to continue to have that mindset but be patient in timing you know and if that means that that we have to sit and let his body recover and and not waste a training camp to fight a guy that he's got a 95 percent chance of beating then and, and you know I think that also Will, will be a factor for Josh now as his motivation. It's, you know, he he'll always do 
15 extra rounds of shadow boxing at night in the, in the boxer's house and he's shadow boxing against bloody uh, Luke or or uh, Lawrence or whatever and he's just he's, he's he's definitely verging on ADHD or something like that but you know the the thing is is now it's just every training camp has to has to count and yeah, um, and he needs motivation because um he's uh you know he's 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 at that stage of his career he's he is the he's at the pinnacle of boxing and you have to be you have to be very uh, selective and and responsible when it comes to that stage when it when it comes to your career just to go back to sort of the camp you mentioned obviously Josh um <laughs> lost his father-in-law a uh, hard time for those around him but also a hard time for your family as well a hard time for both of you there was, you know, from what I saw after the fight, um, overjoyed uh, not only your family, but Josh's family as well. Yeah. Do you think in a way those hardships that you, that you both went through in that camp and endured, sort of, even though you've known each other for such a long time, almost brought you closer together, strengthened that bond? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's, it's, it's just never nice, is it? And um, I think, you know, Josh closed himself off a lot from, from what was happening. Um, and Danielle was having to deal with a lot because... You know, she, she has a younger brother, and you know she had to sort of step up to her plate. Um, and and I think you know he he since has realised that you know he has to you know he has to make sure he goes and spends as much time as possible. And and he even I mean I, I was there when he sort of was apologising that you know I'm sorry I that was just my way of having to just block it out. And but definitely myself and him have. Um, we got closer with with time. We've got it's just one of those things. It's you know you you spend so much time with somebody and and it's just funny with Josh because he'd come in at not the bottom because he was such an established amateur, but he had so many fighters around him and he was the new signing and then he worked his way up so quick. And you know I remember on July the eighth um, he beat Ahara Davies and. Frampton had just lost against Santa Cruz in January and he was having his comeback against Gutierrez and and I remember just thinking like that short space of time from because I, I was training Carl for years and years and I was training George and all these other guys and you know D David was a short period of time but and I remember just seeing that transition go so fast and think wow that was a that's a really hard fight it was a championship level fight and uh, and he just he made those steps so quick um, and now he's the the king of the gym in in that sense he's the guy with the the two world titles and the the ring magazine belt and um yeah so he's had to not say grow up but he's had to deal with a lot of responsibility going through because it happens so quick um not just in the gym i mean it sounds quite selfish but i'm talking about in his in his life you know and and the way boxers see him and people that he used to box with quite quite similar to someone like aj he did that that process so fast that it just you know you, you you you're probably a boxer in GB and looking at AJ thinking oh wait he's you know he's that guy that that was in the gym three years ago or four years ago and now he's that world champion and multi-millionaire and and sometimes that creates quite a bit of hate you know quite a bit of jealousy and stuff like that so uh, Josh is just always taking himself away from that and never never ever talks bad about somebody like if he doesn't have something bad to say he just won't say it at all and and um yeah i just think you know he's i've seen that maturity come through so quick um and it's really nice to see just to touch on you for a minute um you and i were speaking last night when you arrived in liverpool we were quite very jokingly good. yeah it was very day we were quite jokingly talking about obviously you were you were a very good amateur uh took up coaching instead yeah. we we're jokingly talking about imagine if you just turn your hand to professional boxing just just for one run out yeah. Obviously, never going to happen. That said, when you when you reflect and you look back, how glad are you now in the situation you're in, where you've established yourself as one of the world's best trainers? You've got a fine stable of talent there, everything going well in the boxing world. How grateful are you that you made that choice and that you're not still fighting? Oh, I'd be punchy as fuck. <laughs> I mean, I'd be. <laughs> nah, I uh, I am grateful, but I mean, I don't really like. To, you know, I don't. I, I would never have done it for the glory of it. You know, and that, I think from a professional standpoint you have to do it for the glory because that is that's the boxing that's that's the so showmanship you know look at Eubank Senior he did everything for the glory and that's what made him so phenomenal and yeah I had a bit of talent but and I enjoyed what I what I did in, in, in the boxing and I feel like it massively has improved me doing this job I mean I wouldn't have even been anywhere near this job if I hadn't have took boxing up so 
Um, I, I, you know, I definitely I remember I, I used to get coached by dad, obviously, but I remember a guy called Lee Pullen, who's now one of the GB coaches, and he went. He used to always say to me, Shane, just enjoy this because it only it's only short, and you look back at it, and it's it's like a it goes like a flash, but and you'll always ref, you'll spend your whole life reflecting on that boxing uh, those boxing memories and and that period of life and he's he's 100 percent correct with that and it's uh yeah it's great i remember because we were talking about billy joe swan because i used to i used to spar billy joe and uh and yeah it's just it's it's interesting to see someone like him who's a two eight world champion or someone like john Ryder or all these guys that i used to matt yaskins won the novices the year i did it and yeah i mean seeing them all just go through you know the the, the system and it's, it's it's great it's nice it's the purity of boxing to be able to see it from that pure point of view and then suddenly it them go to the pinnacle you know what i mean them go to the top of boxing and and people walking down the street know who they are and it's it's great it's uh it's fantastic and but i'm enjoying what i'm doing now i, I really do i'm enjoying having only you know four fighters at the moment um i you know four or five fighters i, I don't want to be stressing myself i've had a tough year personally and um you know, this is this this is the last hurdle of this year, and I'm going to take some time off and relax, and then I'm looking forward to 2020 and and get my teeth stuck into some hard fights. And uh, you know, I think Campbell's going to have a hard fight in the, in the new year. I was on the phone to Eddie. I said, let's get the Linares rematch. I want that for him. I want to clean his record in in that sense. Um, Taylor want Taylor to fight Ramirez. Um, Whatever opportunity that comes, I want Chris to, to be a champion. I want him to box, you know, react poor and, and uh, you know what I mean? And, 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 and Lawrence obviously has the potential to fight for a, for a world title as well in the new year. So I've got some, got some nice things coming up in 2020, but this is the last little hurdle for me to get over. And then I'll have a little bit of break and uh, go back, in, you know, get back into to training around just after Christmas and, and get our teeth stuck into having a fantastic 2020. Just to touch on a couple of guys you mentioned that are in and around the gym before I let you go, because I appreciate it's late. It's the night before the fight. Uh, Luke Campbell, first and foremost. few rumours he might be on that Phoenix card, uh, that Jacobs Chavez card. Mm. Judging from what you're saying, you're looking at the Linares rematch going into early next year. Does that mean he will now not be boxing Phoenix next month? Yeah, at the, yeah I mean, at pers- I think what it was is I spoke to Eddie. We had a sit down um, and we were going to get him on that card, get him a win. Um, he had a little niggle. From the from the Longmachenko fight, once we started training again, it's still still there a little bit. A guy called Ben Caraway and Daryl Richards have been doing the rehab on it. It's got a lot better. It's, it's in his bicep, but um, but yeah, uh, once again, it's quite similar to the to the JT situation. It's like he's 32. Every camp now has to make sense, and um, you know, there's the Devon Haney who's just got gifted a world title. Um, we'd love that fight. But he, 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 you know, I don't think he's going to be able to go to that fight straight away. So I said, look, let's 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 get him relevant. There's a potential slot in February for a pay-per-view for a chief support of a big pay-per-view show, um, and and I was like, can we get Lenares for it? So speaking to to Eddie, and uh, he's making the phone calls, and we have a meet with him tomorrow, and I think that's going to be the next move for for uh, for Campbell. But obviously. There's, Way away from being anything agreed, but um, that's the sort of pro- that's the sort of approach that I want for for Luke. I want him to be um, in, in in big fights and and in relevant fights and continue to build his name and and better himself as a boxer and until he gets the opportunity again to fight for a world title. And um, I believe he'll do it. Lawrence Coley, um, we we're talking about amateurs coming through and sort of taking a fast track, uh, though it might not always be everyone's cover tea, or particularly pleasing on the eye. Yeah. So effective, so hard to beat. Already claimed Commonwealth, British, and now European titles. Yeah. Is he looking at pushing towards world honours next year? Do you think he's almost ready for that jump? Because there is, at Cruiserweight, quite a big jump from, from sort of that level up to world level. There is, but there's a lot of... There's a, I mean, I personally think uh, Ngarbu was a, was a world-level fighter. He was a very, very good fighter posed a lot of problems yeah it wasn't clean it wasn't it wasn't the most pretty fight but the difference between the Matty Askins fight and the Ngarbu fight and Ngarbu I think is more resilient than someone like Askins and he was a better fighter is that he was able to continue to keep his power 
you know, he believed in his power. He, he, had, he had the balls to fucking start trading up on the inside, and he got the knockout, which is... And it's someone like Lawrence's. It's just happened. We talk about Josh Taylor and how it happened, or Anthony Joshua, how it happened so quick. It's exactly the same for, for Lawrence, if not quicker. Um, he's just bounced on the scene, and he he's learned through sparring. He's learned through fights. And, and sometimes that's not the prettiest way to, to learn. It's better to learn from a technical standpoint and spar less. And then once you're technically sound, then you can start sparring. But he literally just, just winged it, you know. And uh, and he just, he's so effective. And, I, you know, there's Arsene Glamarian, is that his name, who's a WBA super champion and um, launches WBA number two. Um, I, think the, I think he might even be going up. So we, we want that fight, and I want it ASAP for him because, yeah, there's, a, there's a, definitely a big gulf in class between um, Dorticus and Bradis, but not him. And, you know, if we can, if we can pick up a world title, have another, have another good win, another learning fight, defence, and then we go for the other guys. He's only three or four fights away from, from those big names, and, and um, I just think, as you just mentioned, his size, his awkwardness, his punching power, his belief in himself, that's the sort of stuff that separates Lawrence Lacoli from, from other guys. You had a few months to work with him now. When he came to yourself, uh, nobody could question the talent yeah. and the size and the power, as you just mentioned. Uh, but, you know, still relatively green as a boxer, still very raw. In the time you've had to work with him, have you been impressed with his ability to take things on board and impressed with the development you've seen in the gym and in the ring as well? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. He, he picks up things quickly and he's able to implement them. I just need to be able to get him to implement what he does in the sparring into the fight because it's a little bit too frantic. It's a little bit rushed. And I think the fact that he, things get messy with him is just down to his, his, his lack of patience and his eagerness. Um, and that's just, it's just being, you've got 12 rounds, you've got, you got to slow down, relax and keep the speed, but just maintain it you know and and like and, and hold it within and use it to your advantage rather than just burning it up and and, and using a lot of that that uh you know that, that explosiveness so i think yeah it's just he picks things up quick from a balance standpoint he's getting more balance when he first came to me it was his it was his his footwork and his base that was all wrong um he fell over his feet a lot he sort of threw his right leg forward he squared himself up didn't use his jab, pulled with his jab a, a lot. And I really, it's quite frustrating because the, the first guy that we had um, ran, and I wish we'd had Jack Massey because that would have been a perfect you know, um, showcase of what, what he's learned. And then we continued to progress, and then we had Ningabu, a guy that knew he couldn't stand off at distance and punch with him at length. So he was like, I have to get close to this guy. And that's what they all believe. They're all like, okay, well, I have to get close to him and maul him. And, and he's an extreme extremely strong guy in Garbu and he was built like a tank and a good puncher and but he still felt he still came up short you know um, and I just I just really think like if we boxed someone like yeah that Arsene Gul Gulamarian um, he you know he's quite patient quite patient behind his jab that that would be a good blend of stars Dorticus would be a good blend of stars punches long dangerous but Good blender styles and um, and Bradis as well. I think he'll be he'll be a good blend. But I I really believe we're going to see the best in Lawrence Coley once he steps up to heavyweight because um, he can punch like a heavyweight and he's got the size of a heavyweight um, and he's but he's got the speed of a cruiserweight. So I'm really excited once we do what we have to do at the cruiserweight division and then we're going to move up. And I think you know give me a couple of years with him. Give me two three years and. Let's, let's not, you know, let's, let's hope that he keeps him, keeps himself s sane and relaxed and doesn't let success and money go to his head because something I have to keep drilling into him. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about the process and learning how to deal with all these accomplishments and money and, and, and stuff like that. And if he keeps his feet on the ground and if he keeps, keeps learning and he keeps improving, we're going to have a very, a very good fighter on our hands um, in a couple of years' time as a heavyweight. Um, and I believe he'll win a world title as a, as a cruiser in next year. Shane, um, we've been here well over a half hour. Yeah. I appreciate of your time. Got the fight tomorrow night. Um, I think that'll be it until Monday morning. You inevitably find Rob Tebbett camping outside the gym waiting for you. 
Um, but thank you as always. Um, and I'll leave the final word to you. <laughs> now, Rob, Rob definitely will. He'll be, uh, he'll be hassling me. He was getting a bit jealous that we were going to do this interview. And I had to show you some of his texts that he was like, I'll be really jealous when Ryan interviews you. I hope he doesn't do a better job. So, um, Rob, I think you have to give credit to, to Ryan here and just let him take over, mate. You're, you're past it. Your days are numbered. And the, the Boxing Social's backers are, are Team Ryan. Comment section's going to be gunning for me now, but appreciate <laughs> it, Shane. Thank you very much, as always, for speaking at Boxing Social.